So you're ready to start a blog and are wondering what is the best niche? Well, this is definitely the most common question I get by a landslide. However, there are a ton of problems with how traditional niche site advice has been given over the years. Start with a passion, base it on an SEO report, choose the niche that's most lucrative. It simply doesn't work that way. That's why in this video, we'll go through exactly how to choose your specific niche and how this new formula will in turn increase your odds of success and make you more money in the long run. But before we get started, I wanna invite you to watch my free masterclass on how to start a profitable blogging business. It covers exactly what blogging is today in the 2020s, how I make over $300,000 a month with my blog. Thousands of students have gone through it, so make sure to click the link in the description below, sign up for that, and let's get into the topic for today. So first, when we think about choosing your specific niche, we have to talk about the old way of choosing your niche and the problem with traditional niche site advice. So the old way of choosing your niche is basically based on SEO reports, competitive metrics, and passions. So you know, you look at an SEO report or use Ahrefs and you see, oh, this is a good opportunity based on this SEO report or this niche is new and it's based on tools and search data and potential money to be made and things like that. And competitive metrics or something you're passionate about, you know, start with a passion in mind, write about it for years, and that's the niche that you're gonna choose because you have to stay consistent. That simply isn't really the case anymore. And it's really missing the key principles here, the actual real world business principles that are gonna make the blog succeed from a monetary standpoint. So a tiny niche site, you know, there's a lot of things that are missing from just a business standpoint and a human psychology standpoint. So. First of all, we have to discuss what if you choose the wrong niche? So what if you choose that small niche site and then it simply doesn't work or you can never really get Google to trust that specific niche and you know it never works out, you never get traffic. Well, then what happens? You pretty much quit and that's what happens with niche sites a lot. You're also putting all of your eggs in one basket so that you know as much as a niche uh, niches change and evolve over time. So niches never stay the same. New products are added to niches, new you know, technology is in the niche, niches go away, search volume changes. So putting all of your eggs in one basket is tough to build a sustainable business. You also have the inability to pivot. So pivoting is a crucial component of running an online business. The ability to adapt and quickly change what you're doing is really important. And when you're pigeonholed in one small niche, you can't pivot and adapt. The odds of quitting a niche site are also really high when it's not attached to your identity. So if you just create something on the side and you build this website and no one really knows about it and it's just like this small micro niche site, well, it's really easy to quit that. You haven't really invested in it. You haven't tried it because the thing is you're gonna have to do this thing for six months, a year, two years to start making a good amount of money from it. So the odds of quitting are just so much higher because you know, the self-limiting beliefs and the things that we're, we're seeing with this website when it's not quite working out, it's just much easier to quit that niche site when it's not attached to your identity. You also limit the number of partnerships you can make. So when you're in one tiny niche site, well, who's gonna work with you? companies in that niche. So you can't really go outside of that. If my site was just emailmarketingguy.com, I could work with some email marketing software, but I couldn't work with all the other software companies that want to work with me. So you really limit the amount of partnerships you can make in a large business sense when you choose a small niche site. You also lower your revenue ceiling. So, you know, you can tap out your potential niche. Think about this. We'll talk about this later, but how many articles you need um, how much revenue you want to make with your blog, but having a small niche site, you lower your revenue ceiling, you cap, you cap it out at a certain amount and you limit the amount of opportunities that come naturally through this thing because we need to just give ourselves the freedom to pivot and adapt and change content and do these things and test and tweak based on like thinking like a scientist, not trying to force something. And then the odds of choosing the perfect niche at the beginning. So if you're just starting out and you're a brand new blogger, you know, the first choice is choosing this niche. So it's kind of difficult because we're all beginners when we first choose our niche. We're not, you know, SEO experts. Now there's some experts that say that can do this formula. So if you have five years, 10 years of SEO experience and you want to buy and flip niche sites and stuff, that's cool. This doesn't necessarily apply to you. But if you're a beginner and you have some experience but you haven't built one successful blog yet to build, make it profitable, then it's really hard to choose some specific niche at the beginning and make it work because you just don't have that necessarily that advanced knowledge that, that you'll build by doing the thing. So over time, it gets easier, but you need to give yourself this freedom. So the odds of choosing the perfect niche at the beginning if you're a beginner are very low. So in order to combat that, we need to just give ourselves the freedom and flexibility to adapt. And really, it ultimately, it comes down to a real business lives outside of an SEO report. So you know when you think about the online business world, we can't base things just on numbers in a report 
support that think that we're going to be successful. There's human psychology, there's partnerships, there's ways that you're going to do link building and, you know, trades and build affiliate marketing relationships. And all of that is going to be dictated by this first initial choice, which is your domain name and your niche. So if that's not the best way to choose your niche, what is the best way? Well, it has to be personalized to you. This can't just be something we randomly choose. The niche has to be personalized and work in your life specifically. And that's why I created what's called the authority flywheel. So this is an exercise that I go through with students in my course blog growth engine to really uncover and untap the specific niche that'll work best for you. And that's based on four key components. That's based on you, your expertise, the market, and leverage. So we're going to go through each one of these pretty quickly just to show you that a niche has to be selected based on these four key principles. First is you. So you are only you. And you is your identity, your experience, the message you want to share with the world. So you have a unique identity, unique perspective on life. You know, you have a flow of experiences in your past that have gotten you to this point today. So you have to think about what has that done? Who are you? And what message do you want to share with the world? And you are a living, breathing thing, much like a blog. So in a creator economy, your business, your blog is also a living, breathing thing. It needs to adapt and evolve over time. I'm not the same person I was when I was 18. Thank God. I'm not the same person I was tw when I was 25. You know, so I have evolved over time. My flow of experience has changed. So we have to think about that. The first kind of pillar is just thinking about you. Ultimately, if your face was on the homepage of a website, what would it say? What would you be teaching? What would you be telling your blog readers. So that comes down to you and your unique identity. So after you, we want to move next over to your expertise. So your expertise is any area you have experience in. So, you know, and ultimately you have more experience than you think. A lot of students have gone through and said, I don't have, I don't have expertise in this area or that area. Ultimately, you have to know that the internet is full of beginners. So when go people search Google for things and are looking for blogs, they're pretty much at the beginning stage of learning and on their journey. They're not searching for like super advanced stuff. Google doesn't, isn't full of first page results of super advanced math formulas and crazy stuff. It's mainly just for beginners looking for simple sources of information. So, you know, you have experience in different areas and you have personal and professional experience. So this can work here too. So maybe you're in a career, maybe you have hobbies that you're really smart at and you can make money on. Both of these things work. You have to be vulnerable on your journey and share where you are, no matter where you are. So if you're just starting a blog and you want to teach people to blog like I did, I don't recommend it. It's very competitive and difficult, um, but you need to know, you know, teach people exactly where you are. Don't come across as someone that you're not. So your experience level, even if it's one step ahead of a very, a new beginner, that's still expertise to that beginner. So we have to start thinking about what areas of expertise do we have in our personal and professional life? And that's the second rung quickly on this authority flywheel. Then we have the market. So this is really important. So let's say, you know, you've written down some things about you and your expertise and you're brainstorming this stuff. Then we move to the market. And the market is how do you and only you extract value from the marketplace? So based on your experience and your identity, what can you potentially make money with? First, we have to go where the fish are. So that means what are people actually searching for online? So we can't just write about everything with a blog. We have to actually write about things that people care about and search for from an informational standpoint and from a transactional product standpoint. So then we have to determine your pain tolerance. So every niche has different competitive levels. So if you're going to try to go into the finance niche, just know that to do that, you're going to have to spend a few years building links, building partnerships, writing tons of articles and all of that. Whereas maybe you could go into a more e-commerce focused niche like camping or outdoors or like home decor, and you wouldn't need as many links. So your pain tolerance is lower. Maybe your revenue ceiling is a little bit lower, but you're not going to have to go insane and try to, you know, build a million links. So you have to determine your pain tolerance and what your ultimate goals are. Then we have to talk about what are the products in your niche. So think, start writing about and thinking about the affiliate marketing opportunities in your niche. So if you want to write about kitchen stuff, what kind of kitchen gadgets exist? What kind of products are on Amazon that you could write about and review? Looking at keyword tools and trying to see like, you know, the best food processors, the best kitchen faucets, the best uh, microwaves, different like products in your niche that exist that are new and emerging and start to kind of brainstorm what affiliate opportunities are arising. You have to determine basically the overall competitive of your niche and the revenue ceiling of your niche. So the competitiveness, you can use a tool like Ahrefs and you can type in like something like in the keyword explorer, explorer, like best plus your niche. So best camping. And then you'll see all the different keywords and terms that come in that niche and all the competitive metrics. So you can kind of get a high level overview of how competitive the niche is. 
And then you want to kind of plan, start thinking, all right, what are these articles going to be? So, you know, in my course, we cover exactly how to do that. It's exactly what to write, the templates and everything. But this is kind of a, a high level overview of trying to figure out the market potential of your niche. Because ultimately, if you want to make money as a business, this is what is important, not a passion that you're something you're passionate about. So when I'm choosing my niche, I'm passionate about a lot of things. I'm passionate about running. I'm passionate about science and the universe and astronomy. I'm passionate about, like, I like fantasy football with my friends. Um, I'm passionate about lots of things. But if I have to write about them for years, writing about that is way different than actually doing the thing. So you have to really realize that money drives passion more than passion drives money. This is a game. This is a way to make money online as a game. And if you're in the game and you like the game, you will be successful. If you don't like the game and you hate the idea of trying to make money online, then you're probably not going to make it. But you have to be, you know, once you start trickling in money and you see your website working, and you, then the passion comes and you're like, oh, wow, this passion is coming because I see that this result of this niche is actually going to allow me the time freedom that I need to quit my job, to make more money, to do all of these things. And that excitement is what drives you, not necessarily writing about something you enjoy doing as a hobby. It doesn't make sense. So finally, back to the last part of the authority flywheel is your leverage. Leverage is basically anywhere you are that you can get some hidden advantage from. So we all have different starting lines when starting an online business. Some of us have zero you know, SEO experience, zero digital marketing experience. Some of us have some, some of us have a lot. Some of us have a lot of connections. Some of us have you know, maybe personal friends or something that could help us get into an industry. You know, imagine you're in the film industry. Who do you know that can get you in? This is kind of the same thing in blogging. Like, who do you know in some industry that might be able to get you some links or some opportunities for guest posts or, you know, early affiliate things? For example, when I was in my career, I was a middle manager at a company in Austin in the tech industry. And I kind of just used that little middle manager title in some of my outreach and it helped. So what little points of leverage, even a little thing, can push you forward in a niche? So that's just the last thing to think about. And here's the most common question I get, definitely by far. It says, Adam, what niche should I choose? And I get this question on YouTube, in the blog comments, and all over the place. And it's like, tell me my niche. What's the best niche? Should I go into finance? And it's like, do you have any experience in finance? Ultimately, that's like asking a total stranger, what business should I start? I can't give you that. You have to go through this exercise. You have to understand you, your identity, your expertise, you know, the market and any leverage that you have. And I can't tell you that. You shouldn't just go into any niche based on SEO reports, metrics, and things that you think can make money. Another one I get is this. I have no experience, no leverage, multiple hobbies all over the place, and I live in my mom's basement too. So let's talk about the power of self-limiting beliefs because when you actually put this stuff down on paper and you see... This is my experience. This is the affiliate opportunities. These are all the different things that I could make money on. You start to see that there's opportunity everywhere, not just in some niche about making money online or finance or crypto or something that you think will make money. What if you have a pet? What if you have a cat or a dog? And you're like, I love my dog. Well, think about all the things that you could write about in the pet niche. There's tons of opportunities, low hanging fruit and opportunities there. Or maybe you enjoy home decorating and interior design and you're a stay-at-home mom and you're like, I love coming up with ideas and design inspiration for living rooms and kitchens and I go on Wayfair all the time and I do this stuff. Well, then create a home, a home blog and just write about living room ideas, modular sofa designs. You could make a ton of affiliate revenues, you know, for ranking for something like best modular sectional, which isn't that competitive, which could make a ton of money, funneling traffic, writing about ideas, writing about these things. So you don't have to be an expert. But you, you know, have something, you have to understand this stuff. The more that you learn, the more success you'll find. So first, let's discuss what makes a good niche. Really, there's tons of different niches out there. Any, you know, anything from travel, home, outdoor, all of these things. But ultimately, it comes down to kind of three key factors. So number one is finance. So finance is high reward, high competition. Finance is something that can make a lot of money. And we see sites like Credit Karma, NerdWallet. All these financial sites make a ton of money because they can make money on percentages of huge things. What I mean by that is if somebody signs up for like an IRA or a retirement plan or a business loan or something worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, the blog can make a percentage of that. So they could make something like 10% of $500,000 and make a $50,000 affiliate commission on one sale. So it's high risk, high competition. That's why it's so competitive. Tons of big sites are entering the space and are already in the space. But it's, you know, when I think of finance, I think of percentages of really high value things. 
So that's what that think when I think about that niche. Next, we have software. So software is great for the recurring nature of the affiliate programs. That's why it's competitive as well, because people buy things every month. You can make affiliate commissions like 30% of that monthly payment, and it builds stability. That's why I don't worry so much about traffic fluctuations and all of these things, because there's stability built into that. So that's why that one is also competitive. Then we have all physical products. So this is things like I said, camping, kitchen, living room, outdoor, patio, um, recreational things. Think of Amazon. So everything on Amazon has people searching for these products on Google. Every product category that exists is searched for on Google and blogs are expected to be there as a source of information comparing these products. With physical products, it's a volume game because affiliate commissions come in as a one-time payment. So think of like a basketball hoop. If you write an article on the best basketball hoops, and you make a 10% commission on a $1,000 basketball hoop, that's a $100 one-time commission. It's not $50,000 and it's not recurring, it's one time. So physical products, less, co less competitive, which I think a lot more people should be entering these spaces because you don't need as many links, you don't need to build that authority, you just write articles on products. The revenue ceiling is a little bit lower, but you make up for it with volume. So you can write a, t a lot of articles over time, 100, 200 articles over the course of a few years, and then you're making a lot of money as each article is its own mini business. So when I think about niches, I think about these three main categories, not like a hundred categories. So that's kind of how I think about that. Then we have what I'm calling, you know, YMYL, Google Eat and the competition. So YMYL is your money, your life. Google Eat is expertise, authoritativeness and trust and the competition. So know that when you're choosing a niche, you have to look at the niche landscape from a competitive standpoint, but you also look at it from like an authority standpoint. So if you, one of the hardest ones, for example, is entering the health niche. So if you wanna compete with WebMD and Healthline, that's gonna be the hardest one because Google, like when it becomes something that's related to life and money, that's where you know it's the most competitive and you need the most authority because Google's not just gonna rank a random blogger about how to, you know, um, wash your hands to avoid COVID or something like that. Like that would be really risky. So that's where Healthline and WebMD and these articles written by health experts and then you know trusted and verified by this guy, that's where all of those things come in. And that's why finance is, is competitive too and you need a lot of authority because you're recommending things like credit cards or business loans, like that can change somebody's life. The site needs more authority. So that's something to be aware of. So things that are higher, you know, intensity and risk for the reader are going to be more, you're going to be need more authority and links for. So that's just something to keep in mind. So then when we think about creating a niche site, we think about the path to 100 articles. So instead of creating a, like a tiny site and one tiny area, think about having 100 articles eventually on that blog. Would the, comp would the niche be completely tapped out? Would you be completely done with content at that point? Or would you still have room to grow? That's why we, you know, we'll go over exactly kind of how to do this, but kind of think about it that way. So we don't want to write 20 articles and then be like, that's the whole niche. That's the site. I'm going to make money with that. No, that's not how blogging works. We need 100 articles, 200 articles. Eventually, over time, we keep building it and building it in the background of our life. It's making money passively. We have writers. We do all of these things. But we need hundreds of articles eventually. So your niche needs to be big enough for that. Ultimately, we talked about surveying the niche landscape. So that's just using keyword research tools like Ahrefs or something else to see how competitive in a broad sense the niche is. Even just go to Google and just search some specific products in the niche to see you know, what kind of sites are ranking and how authoritative they are. And then we also have, uh, we wanna have multiple sub niches and areas to pivot into. So inside of a niche, inside of a broad niche, what kind of different things can we write about? If it's home, we could do all kinds of things from living room to kitchen to gardening to all of these things. So. There's a lot of different sub niches and product categories to look into. The key though here, what I really like the most is a niche with a lot of new and emerging product categories. So what I mean by that is there's new technology coming into the niche and new things to write about because timing is a, com a crucial component of ranking and timing is something that you don't find in that SEO report. Timing comes from niche authority and understanding the niche yourself. That's why we're doing this niche exercise first because if you understand the niche, you have a, a head start on understanding what products are entering the space. You write the articles first, you have a better chance of ranking. And that comes down to how many emerging product categories are coming out. Are there new technology, new gadgets, new features in that niche that you can write about? Like software has a ton of new categories coming in. Gadgets and technology has a ton of new categories and products coming in like Peloton, Peloton alternatives, all these new mirror devices in the home for fitness. Some niches don't change as much. So maybe something like golf, golf has a lot of new 
new golf clubs every year, but that's seasonal. So you have to kind of think about your niche, like how much is it changing? How much is it evolving? And ones that are evolving faster are easier to rank for. So think about that as well. So here's the new way I like of choosing your niche. You start broad. You start with a broad domain name in one broad niche. So we don't want to do multiple niches where it's like, I'm going to do gardening and software. I'm going to do travel, and I'm also going to do living room furniture. Like those are two way too different. But if you start with one broad niche, then you don't have to perfect this perfect sub niche. Maybe you have ideas for the sub niche, and you can start with some content in that area. But we don't want to pi uh, pigeonhole ourselves with our domain name. So our domain name should be broad enough to encompass the niche so that we can eventually get it to 500 plus articles without pigeonholing ourselves. And we can adapt and test multiple sub niches. So that's how you do it. And then you pivot into what's working. So your expertise, authoritativeness, and trust can overlap multiple topic areas. So if we're talking about travel and you want to start a travel blog, then we can talk about travel credit cards, travel insurance. We can talk about the best meals in Italy. We can talk about travel backpacks and luggage and all the physical products. And we're not just pigeonholed into only travel credit cards or something like that. So think about the multiple sub niches. We can test and tweak this, this content strategy, but we need to start broad enough to be able to actually give ourselves the freedom to understand and figure this thing out. So let's look at some examples here. So in the travel niche, the niche site example we would do is to look at the SEO report, look at the competitive analysis, and then create a domain name called travelcreditcards.com. Great domain name, that'd be cool. But what if you know you want to talk about other things like travel backpacks and, and meals in Italy and how to travel solo, you know, through Europe or any number of travel articles? It'd be a little bit weirder if travel credit cards was writing about it. It would seem too corporate -y and kind of strange and probably be harder to rank, harder to get link opportunities and all of that. But look at someone like Nomadic Matt. Great domain name ranks for everything under the sun when it comes to travel, insurance, credit cards, how to travel the world, all of these different things. And that's just a broader example. Another one is home. So you could create a, a website like smarthomedevices.com. Great domain name again, could be work, could work, could you know work out well. But what if you wanna talk about something that isn't a smart home device? What if you wanna talk about something that's a home device that you find a good opportunity and a good keyword, but it's not really, it doesn't really make sense. Then that domain pigeonholes you. But then look at a site like Tom's Guide, writes about every piece of technology and software under the sun and ranks for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of keywords with that simple domain name. Let's talk about software. So I could have started my blog at ecommerceguy.com. That's the world that I came from. But then wouldn't it be weird when I started talking about like virtual conference platforms and uh, how to start a blog and make money online and passive income and all these other things that have nothing to do with e-commerce? Yes, it would have been. So I would have pigeonholed myself into this niche thing. And the domain does not need to be your niche. My domain name is just my name. So, you know, you need to give yourself the maximum freedom to pivot. So then it comes down to the ultimate question, and I get it a lot. Should you use your own name or not use your name? I get it. It's like, Adam, you know, what if you want to sell your blog? You know, use your name. It's really hard to. What about all these things? And I get all these questions about me selling my blog from people. And like, I want to sell my blog before they even have made $1 yet. So we need to take a step back, realize that we want to build a passive income driven business for our lives. And really, it's up to you. Like, you could use Tom's Guide, which is kind of a corporate view of it with a name, but not really the full name. Or you could use it just like I did with my full name. Ultimately, it doesn't matter all that much. What does matter is the content and link building strategy and the, the monetization strategy. That matters more than anything. I like the full name just because it keeps it simple. It makes outreach easier, link building, all that stuff, and gives you the ultimate freedom to pivot. But if you don't like the idea of having your face on the website and you want to be more of a ghost niche site, that's fine too. You can do that, but still keep it broad enough so that you can test one large niche and then find your actual niche, sub niche topics over time. So the truth is niches evolve just like your identity and your experience. Niches change, search volume changes, things come and go product wise outside of the niche. And so does your identity, the things that you care about. So that's why passions don't work. That's why tiny niche sites don't work. Putting all your eggs in one basket doesn't necessarily work. But Tailoring a blog specifically to you and what you're interested in, what you can provide to the market and changes and adapts with your life is the ultimate key. And the truth is you are the niche. Think of what I've done with my blog. I started with my name. I wrote about all kinds of software, make money online. I saw what was working. I pivoted the content. I did that. I moved to YouTube. I create these videos. There's no, you know, I can pivot into anything. We're pivoting into finance content, all other areas. 
And it's because I started broad and thought like a scientist and I'm doing this, you know, in a different way. So it's not about a tiny niche site. It's about creating a real sustainable brand to rank and compete in the 2020s. So if you're interested, if that was helpful to you, if you want to learn more about what I did with my blog, how I make over $300,000 a month, some of the strategies, make sure to watch my free blogging masterclass. So click the link in the description below. Thousands of students have gone through it. And let me know, what do you think about the authority flywheel? Because the more authority that you build with your uh, unique experience, identity, market, and leverage, it is a snowball effect. A flywheel is something that continues to grow and continues to grow. One increase to one input improves all outputs. So this is a thing that just scales your authority online. And to build real authority, you need to be known for something. So I hope that video was helpful. Please like the video, check out my channel for all, all kinds of other videos on blogging and business advice, and I will see you in the next video.